Good evening. Two hellish nightmares coming together in one terrible reality. That is the story of the Lockerbie disaster, of how death and destruction in the sky brought death and devastation on the ground below. In this special edition on the crash of Pan Am Flight 103, which has almost certainly cost the lives of more than 270 people, we examine the growing conviction that terrorist sabotage was the cause of the disaster. We'll also be considering the startling possibility that warnings of a bomb attack on Pan Am were given but not fully acted upon. And with the help of a former security advisor to President Reagan, we'll be assessing which terrorist group might have carried out such an outrage. On both sides of the Atlantic tonight, people are still coming to terms with the scale of the Lockerbie air crash. When Pan Am Flight 103 from Frankfurt to New York via London broke up and fell out of the sky yesterday evening, it was Britain's worst air disaster. None of the 259 people on board, most of them Americans, survived. And at least 17 people are feared to have lost their lives on the ground as flaming wreckage ploughed into the small border town of Lockerbie. The jumbo jet, which had been airborne for less than an hour after taking off from Heathrow, scattered debris over a wide area to the east of the town. The cockpit of the aircraft fell in open country three miles away. But Lockerbie itself took the full force of the crash, as a section of the plane gouged a 30-foot crater through a row of houses. Nearby, the busy A74 dual carriageway was engulfed by a fireball. It's still not clear how many people died in their cars there. Tonight, with the search for more bodies suspended until the morning, questions about the disaster are concentrated on the cause of the crash. And there is now very strong speculation that a terrorist bomb caused the plane to disintegrate in mid-air. It has even emerged that American embassies in Europe were warned on Tuesday last week about a possible bomb attack on a Pan Am flight from Frankfurt to the United States. The public were apparently not informed of any threat. We'll be looking at these points in detail a little later, but first, Gavin Estler reports from the scene of last night's crash. Tonight, here in Lockerbie, the town is settling down as best it can to a tragedy which has destroyed Christmas for the community. Local people say they can hardly find the words to express their grief at a catastrophe many of them actually witnessed. Like an earthquake, said one. The sky seemed to be raining fire, said another. The day none of us will ever forget. I didn't know what it was, and then we rushed outside and just all this debris coming down. It came straight down, and then this great mass of flames, and I turned to run, but there was nowhere to run to. It looked like a scene out of hell. This whole road was ablaze. For their part, throughout the day, the emergency services had continued the task of making sense of the wreckage and recovering the bodies. But at dusk tonight, the 600-member specialist teams began to scale down their activities, waiting until first light tomorrow to resume again in force. The day had begun with the search teams concentrating on six separate locations in and near Lockerbie, where most of the wreckage and bodies have been discovered. American officials and FBI agents assisting British accident investigators from the Department of Transport. On the hillsides outside the town, the wreckage was spread across fields, though the battered Pan Am cockpit remained recognizable. Both black box flight recorders, with their vital clues as to what went wrong, were quickly found, though the complex analysis of data could take weeks. The fact that the debris was spread so far and wide apparently confirmed the belief that the aircraft somehow blew apart at 31,000 feet and at a speed of over 500 miles an hour. More than 150 bodies of passengers and crew were discovered at the six locations targeted by the search teams, leaving another 100 bodies yet to be found. Crash investigators refused to be drawn on the question of sabotage. Whether it exploded or not, I don't know. It does seem to us, it does appear on the face of it that it had a structural failure in the air, but uh, we won't be able to say why for quite some time. In the town of Lockerbie, one body believed to be of a passenger was discovered in the roof of a house. The Sherwood Park estate, the worst hit area, was cordoned off. Eight homes were severely damaged, almost to destruction, said the police. Thirteen adults and four children in the area are missing. Police said there is grave concern for their safety. A mains water pipe was cut, gas supplies were cut off, many telephones reported not working, a town picking up the pieces when it should have been preparing for Christmas. 
There were those who tried to bring comfort to the bereaved and to display the nation's grief. Prince Andrew joined the search teams inspecting the sites of the disaster and afterwards spoke of his concern. Very difficult to, to have any message for, for, for the people of Lockerbie, apart from my uh, sincere condolences for what has happened. I suppose that statistically, something like this has got to happen at some stage on a time. It is most sad and unfortunate that it's had to happen to Lockerbie. Then the Prime Minister and Scottish Secretary Malcolm Rifkin spent several hours seeing the sites of worse damage. Mrs Thatcher told local people of her sorrow. Well, there are quite a lot of broken windows yes. and the gardens are full of... Back of the engine right in there. The deck, then, of yes. course, there are the cars on the road as well. Yes. Uh -huh. you know, it was a terrible, terrible. I think the worst accident we've had. Yes. Clearly moved, the Prime Minister spoke of the scenes at the crash sites. It is even worse in daylight than it looked on television at night. Now you can see the full enormity of the damage and the extent of it. Uh, and the way in which there's pieces of aircraft and twisted metal scattered over a wide area and the number of houses that are damaged. Um, and the, the people in them must have wondered just whatever was happening, as indeed the people in the aircraft must have had this, well, it was just terrible. Tonight in Lockerbie, the police continued planning for the resume search tomorrow. Local people checked the list of survivors posted at the town hall. The town hall itself has become a morgue for the bodies coming down from the hillsides. At the end of a long day, I spoke to the Scottish Secretary of State, Malcolm Rifkin, who spent much of the past 24 hours in Lockerbie. I think both the Prime Minister and I found this to be a completely unforgettable experience. It's very traumatic indeed, because not only the agony of an air disaster, but the almost unprecedented experience for a Scottish town uh, of an aircraft which is split into a large number of very large fragments scattered around the countryside. So we saw, for example, the cockpit completely separated from the rest of the aircraft uh, in a field several miles from the nearest other parts of the aircraft in uh, Lockerbie, just a mile or so from here, a huge crater on the ground where houses previously existed, a normal, quiet residential suburb, part of it totally destroyed. From the briefings you've had, have you got any pointers as to what might have caused this? No, I think it's too early. We have people here from the accident uh, unit of uh, the Department of Transport. They are the professionals in this uh, sphere. And uh, obviously, because the, uh, the accident took place over land, a very large part of the aircraft will be recovered. And hopefully that will enable them to identify the cause. Have you any indication as to how soon they might be able to do that? I know in the past these inquiries tended to take a very long time, but they've been speeded up in recent years. Well, I did ask myself that very question, and I was told at this stage it's difficult to predict. As your question rightly implies, sometimes it can take a matter of two or three days, sometimes it takes much longer. It depends on the nature of the uh, air aircraft remains that are found and what clues they provide, what evidence, evidence they provide as to the sort of cause of the accident. And finally, what more remains for you to do now? Well, indeed, uh, I think the main responsibility, of course, is with those in the uh, emergency services. Uh, the Scottish office is responsible for the way the emergency services operate and if there are incidents of this kind in Scotland, so we will be keeping a very close eye. And also, I think the important thing to remember is that for the local community in Lockerbie, there is still a major problem over many days and many weeks, because even uh, those who have survived and who may be physically uninjured, clearly the experience will be an enormously distressing one. And we have to do what we can to help the local community, uh, both financially if that is required, uh, and in other ways. They will need the support of the public throughout the United Kingdom, and I'm sure they will receive that. Of course, the people of Lockerbie are not alone in their grief. They'll soon be joined by the relatives of those killed on the plane itself, flying in from America. And when that happens, the identification of the bodies will begin. And we'll have more from Gavin in Lockerbie before the end of the programme. As the Dumfrieshire town continues to absorb the scale of last night's disaster, across the Atlantic, friends and relations of American passengers on Flight 103 are beginning to mourn their dead too. But amid the grief, there is much debate in America over a specific warning of terrorist action against Pan Am flights from Europe. A warning which came in the form of a telephone call to the American embassy in Helsinki from a man purporting to be a member of a radical Palestinian group. That warning was circulated some days later to American embassies and airlines and to the British government in London. 
and a similar warning came from the Israeli security service Mossad. So tonight, in view of these various warnings, Americans are asking why their public wasn't told as well. From Washington, Martin Bell reports. 38 of the victims were students coming home to Syracuse University in New York State. They didn't get there. The university mourns them. Let us embrace with a handshake, with a hug. Reach out. Embrace. They shared their grief at the university, a grief felt far beyond Syracuse. The sense of shock extended to the United Nations, where Secretary of State George Shultz was presiding over a treaty signing ceremony. He paid tribute to Bernd Carlson, the senior UN official killed in the crash, and he remembered the others too. We grieve for all those who lost their lives, and we extend profound sympathy to their relatives and their friends. Please join me in a silent moment of grief and prayer. The United Nations was mourning and so was the United States, but it was also questioning. And the questions that State Department spokeswoman Phyllis Oakley had to deal with centered on the advance warning the Americans received of just such an attack as may have happened last night. I can also confirm that on December 5, 1988, an unidentified individual telephoned the U.S. Embassy in Helsinki and stated that sometime within the next two weeks there would be a bombing attempt against a Pan American aircraft flying from Frankfurt to the U.S. According to the caller, an, an unidentified person in Helsinki would unwittingly take the device to Frankfurt and eventually onto the U.S. bound flight. We receive dozens of threats each day. We always take them seriously. In this case, we took action immediately and we began to assess the threat. The action included a notice actually posted at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow warning of the possible danger of flying Pan Am through Frankfurt and suggesting that embassy staff might like to go home another way. That provoked a storm of protest. If U.S. officials knew of the peril, why didn't the general public? Sometimes by going public, you achieve, you, you, you give uh, uh, undue attention to what the terrorist wants to call attention to. And so often it's best to handle these matters by aborting the threat. But if, if you want me to say that if we have specific in, information that a specific flight was going to be specifically targeted and that information had any credibility to it, then I think widespread notices should be given and people should well know uh, that they were putting their lives at risk. It's the administration contention that nothing that specific was known. But the distinction between government officials and the general public is keenly felt, especially by Syracuse students lucky enough to travel on other flights. It's a tragedy. I don't care if it was a diplomat or a student like me. It's all equal in my eyes. No one, no one deserved to die or anything. I got him home. I got him home and I'm safe and I wasn't one of the unlucky ones. Yeah. Martin Bell in Washington. Tonight in London, the United States Ambassador Charles Price confirmed that his embassy had received a warning on the 9th of December of a terrorist threat. But such threats, he said, originate with some frequency. But the fact that there was a warning is just one piece in the jigsaw of circumstantial evidence suggesting that a bomb, rather than intrinsic structural failure, was to blame for the disaster. Margaret Gilmore now assesses the probabilities either way and reports on the people who might have planted a bomb on Flight 103. As the principal carrier for American troops based in Europe, Pan Am is frequently threatened with sabotage. Officials have not ruled out the possibility of structural failure, but they are giving strong credence to the bomb theory. Tonight, Scotland Yard's anti-terrorist squad has taken charge of the London end of the investigation into the disaster. It's possible it was a bomb, and I believe that that is why they are sifting very carefully through the evidence to prove either it was a bomb or, in fact, if it was structural failure. 
It was a disaster of such proportions that the crew was unable to communicate with the ground, which means to say that they were either incapacitated due to the fact they were unconscious or the uh, aircraft was sufficiently damaged so that communications couldn't be established, either of which is a major uh, disaster. Clues as to exactly what happened will lie with two black boxes similar to these, which record detailed technical accounts of the plane's passage and a record of conversations in the cockpit. Both have been retrieved from the wreckage of the plane. Through the information they'll provide, and with forensic evidence from the scene of the crash, investigators should be able to establish whether in fact there was a bomb. With regard to a bomb explosion, deposits of chemicals that are the result of um, the explosive device going off, um, uh, that is certainly uh, one of the things you'll be looking for. And another thing is the nature of the fracture itself under a microscope, whereby the heat of the explosion actually melts the metal and then it hardens again, and it hardens in a particular form. While it's clear the authorities are taking the bomb theory seriously, there's other evidence to support this view. The pilot of Pan Am Flight 103 gave no warning or mayday call. The plane simply disappeared from radar screens. But if a bomb had been planted in the front luggage hold, it would have caused an explosion which would have split the plane in two, separating the cockpit from the main part of the fuselage, as happened in this case. What's more, an Air India plane which crashed into the sea off Ireland in 1985 broke up in a similar way. An inquiry decided this was probably because of a terrorist bomb attack. Captain Mike Wallace flies jumbos similar to the one which crashed last night. Uh, there had to be something, in, in my view, uh, which had put the crew in a position so they could not communicate with the ground. This means they were either unconscious, they were physically incapable, or the aircraft was destroyed to such an extent that not only all of the electric system, but the standby electrics and the battery and the radios were all damaged. I don't believe that's a possibility you could consider all happening at the same time, unless the explosion was of such massive proportions it blew the aircraft apart. The flight route started at Frankfurt, where today passengers face tight controls. This is one of Europe's busiest airports and has an exceptionally good reputation for security. Pan Am Flight 103 started here and flew to London, where some people left the flight and the rest boarded another plane, the fated 747. Bags boarded in Frankfurt would have been placed in sealed containers and transferred unchecked in London. Tonight, Pan Am said they could guarantee that every piece of baggage on the flight was matched to a passenger. There's no doubt that routine security checks would have been enforced. The first stage is carried out by the airport authorities. Suitcases are checked in and taken away. Some airlines x-ray them, others do not. The passengers themselves are scrutinized as they go through passport control. Their hand luggage must pass through an X-ray machine and sometimes it's then searched as well while the passenger goes through a metal detector. It's then that some airlines bring in a second security check. It was through these extra measures that El Al guards discovered a bomb at Heathrow Airport in 1986. There are human beings running these systems with the stress of running a busy airport and operating in one where you have the giant flow through of people and travel has increased and more and more people traveling all the time and the pressure on the people governing these points is immense it would only need a fraction of a second or a minute of lapsed concentration to have somebody who was carefully planning working in a team to take something through Amongst a number of claims and theories, if indeed this was a terrorist attack, was one from a group calling themselves the Guardians of the Islamic Revolution, who said it was an act of vengeance for the loss of an Iranian Airbus shot down by the USS Vincennes in the Gulf in July. If that was the case, it would also have been an attempt to show that revolutionary Islamic fundamentalism lives on. It coincides very well indeed with the objectives of radical fringe groups inside Iran who are currently under attack by the Iranian government. They would like to demonstrate to the outside world that Hajat Islam Rafsanjani and his government are not in fact in charge in Iran to their own domestic opinion that they are capable of carrying out threats made by Iranian leaders at the time of the downing of the Iran Airbus by the US Navy in July and thirdly to demonstrate to their supporters in the Lebanon that the export of the Islamic Revolution is still a viable comp uh, concept 
something which the Iranian government at present is anxious to deny. As well as a claim from a Libyan organization today, the theory that some breakaway group of the PLO were responsible is also being considered. They would want to discredit Yasser Arafat, who last week renounced violence. The United States then agreed to start talks with the PLO so long as they kept their word on this. Well, the words must be matched by performance. And if they're not, why, <laughs> we're back uh, where we started. Abu Nidal is the man most likely to try to disrupt Yasser Arafat's talks with America. His group has carried out 30 terrorist attacks in the past 15 years. I think if it is a sabotage and it is connected to the recent events in the Middle East, it could be Abu Nidal. Why would they want to do that? To compromise Yasser Arafat, to show to the Arab world and particularly to the Palestinians that he is a traitor of the uh, Palestinian cause, of the purity of the ide ideological revolution. And also perhaps by doing so, they are hoping that the Americans would, uh, would change their mind and would not negotiate with Yasser Arafat. All this speculation rests on the theory that this was a bomb. But the crash could have been caused by a structural fault. In August 1985, a Japan Airways 747 plunged into a hillside because of a faulty repair in the rear cabin wall. But there was a difference. Then the plane took several minutes to crash and the pilot had time to report his difficulties. So what are the giveaway signs of a structural fault? The most important thing to find there is the uh, uh, structure immediately adjacent to the fracture between the cockpit area and the rest of the aircraft. Now the suspicion must be um, that it is related to uh, trouble that was reported about a couple of years ago with the frames underneath the cockpit area uh, for which a major repair scheme was issued by the Boeing company and uh, approved by the FAA in the States and the CAA in this country. As the inquiry into exactly what happened gets into full flow, passengers for tonight's departure of Pan Am Flight 103 turned up at Heathrow Airport. With tension high after the crash, security was acute. The flight was delayed for an hour and a half because of a bomb scare. But at this early stage, there are fears that the accident, whether terrorist or structural, could have repercussions for many months to come. And joining us now from Washington is Jeffrey Kemp, who's a former special assistant to President Reagan on national security affairs. First of all, do you think the probability is that a bomb caused this disaster? Well, I'd say on, on balance, yes. It, it clearly looks like it was an explosion rather than a structural fault, but I'm not a professional, so but I, I'll, I'll go with the bomb theory. As far as the warnings that were given are concerned, do you accept Vice President Bush's line tonight that nothing specific enough was known about the credibility of this threat to sound a full-scale alarm? Yes, I agree with him on that, but where I think there is going to be a lot of domestic repercussion is the fact that a, a warning was issued evidently in the Moscow Embassy to U.S. personnel there. Uh, now, the fact that that warning was issued will create, it seems to me, a lot of questions here precisely because, as the Vice President said, you get these warnings every day. And why do you think the general public were not uh, warned about it too? Well, if you get warnings every day, you're going to completely disrupt Pan Am and TWA flights out of Europe, and that is precisely what the terrorists want, assuming it's a terrorist incident. So you have to uh, keep a balance. The question is, should the embassy people have been tipped off? I don't believe they should have been. You don't think there's any question here of uh, information being withheld in order to protect uh, airline uh, profits, slender though these are? No, I, I, I don't think so. That, that, that type of fact would always get out. It will always create a firestorm, as indeed it is tonight here in Washington. Now, who do you think is most likely to have perpetrated such an atrocity, assuming it was a deliberate act of sabotage? Right. Well, I, I guess there are sort of three groups that are going to be speculated about. There have been, as you know, many attacks on American personnel in Europe over the years. So it could be a European-based group. It could also be Abu Nidal uh, in an effort to make Mr. Arafat's job a lot harder as he begins negotiations with the United States. And indeed, it could be Iranians, renegade Iranians, wanting to get revenge for the downing of the uh, Iranian Airbus. 
It also could be other groups, but I would say the three I named are the most likely. Uh, and, and two of these were also outlined in Margaret Gilmer's report a few moments ago. Of, of the two main ones, the Iranian suggestion and the PLO suggestion, to which of these two would you incline? I'd incline to the Iranian if only that the timing of the uh, a Palestinian attack uh, based on Arafat's decision to talk to the United States would imply incredibly careful planning at a very fast pace, which I doubt is possible. The, the, the PLO or a, a splinter group of the PLO, you were saying, uh, wouldn't have had time to react uh, to Arafat's uh, vault farce in time for such a complicated operation. Well, of course, they may have been anticipating Arafat's vault farce for much longer uh, and therefore could have planned it. So I'm, I'm just speculating tonight. I would say it could be either uh, renegade Palestinians or Iranians, and I wouldn't want to bet on either. Just a final speculation, if I may press you to that, Mr. Kemp. If this does prove to have been caused by an act of terrorism, what do you imagine the United States response will be? There's been talk today in Washington about uh, a, a line that President Reagan made in a, an interview to David Brinkley where he talked about retaliation against the Libyan chemical plant that we know they're building. My guess is that if, it, if it's identified that Libya or any particular country were involved in this in the Mideast, there would be retaliation. If not, what it's going to mean is very tough guidelines for Mr. Arafat. His job is harder this evening. He is going to have to prove every time there's a terrorist incident involving Americans that he wasn't involved. That's a tough hoop to jump through. Jeffrey Kemp, thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight. Thank you. And at that point, we return to Locker Bay. A short time ago, I spoke again to Gavin Esler there, who had the latest details on the casualty figures and on the search for those reported missing in the town. Well, of course, Donald, as you can understand, in this weather and in the darkness, there's not much searching going on uh, overnight until tomorrow morning when, of course, it will resume at first light. So in terms of casualty figures, the latest we have will probably remain uh, uh, the same during the course of the night. The latest casualty figures are that more than 150 bodies have been disco discovered, of which some 60 are in the makeshift morgue in the town hall behind me. And of those, some three are of children from the plane. We understand that no bodies from people here in Lockerbie itself have been discovered, although 13 adults from Lockerbie and four children remain missing. And of course, uh, no one has any idea how many people may have been killed on the A74 road just outside of here. There's a few uh, cars, I think about five cars, that are completely wrecked on the road. In fact, they're so badly damaged that you can't even read the registration numbers, which gives you some idea of the task awaiting the emergency services when they resume tomorrow morning. And how would you sum up the mood in the town tonight? Well, it's extraordinary how a calamity can exist alongside normality. There are people with Christmas trees in the windows, the lights going on and so on. And uh, you walk 50 yards down the road and you see these gaps in the buildings, these holes in the road. You can smell uh, whatever it was that had been burning during the course of today. I suppose for me the mood was summed up by some people in a television shop here in town with whom we watched the television news earlier today when they saw the tragedy of, of Lockerbie going all around the world. And they were able to pick out the, the faces in the crowds, the names of people who had lucky escapes, tell me a little of the stories of those people. And someone, someone said on television that, uh, of course, it could have been worse. Well, of course, that's true, but not according to the people here in Lockerbie I've been talking to. And is, finally, is there any further indication of when the inquiry may tell us for certain what actually happened last night? That's very difficult to say. Of course, it could be in a few days because they have discovered the two black box flight recorders and they'll be taking them down for analysis if they've not already done so. And of course, if uh, there was an explosion on board, the explosives themselves will leave traces, which should be, one would think, and according to people we've been talking to here, should be among the first things that they would discover if, in fact, an explosion has occurred. Gavin, thanks very much indeed. And a quick look now at how some of tomorrow morning's front pages deal with the aftermath of the disaster. Bomb may have destroyed jet. The independent U.S. was warned of air attack. The Telegraph, U.S. was warned of bomb threat. The Times, bomb warnings ignored. The Guardian, why weren't they? The public told us. The Daily Mail, who could do this, asks the Daily Mirror. And the Sun gives the whole page over to a, a photograph. Disaster special, Death Valley, it says. And that's all from this special edition of Newsnight. From all of us on the programme, a very good night to you.